All right, good morning. Before we get started with our sermon today, I know it's been two weeks since we've last seen each other, so it is good to be back. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give you an overview or a uh, review of what's transpired over the last two weeks. Life, uh, uh, Pastor Reed, just so you know, some people have been asking how the house has been coming along. I appreciate the emails and uh, the texts and all about, about my dad's house we've been building and all that. So I figured instead of just explain everything to you, I'd show you with some um, visual aids. So before we get started, I'll show you those here. So here, day one, we got the excavator in. You'll see I've got my Marine Corps wet weather gear on because it was cold and rainy. The one day we had with the excavator was possibly the coldest, rainiest day of summer. And uh, yes, we've got wet weather gear on. And then we have, uh, we've got the, the excavator here. You see, we're, we're currently trying to locate utilities, which we did find them, um, gas, sewer, water, electric, and we accidentally cut the phone line. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know the 811, call before you dig? Well, now we can't call anybody. <laughs> so, call before you dig. It's not a joke. This is not a drill. And nobody noticed the phone was out. So, you know, nobody was bothering us. You know. Uh, and that's my brother and one of my boys, uh, the youngest boy. He is fascinated by trucks, trailers, and excavators. So he got to run one for the day. And here, we were trying to find the septic tank. We did find it, so that's why we're all so happy. We dug the entire, almost the entire site up looking for this one septic tank. And of course, we had to replumb it. And the water and all around there is not rainwater. <laughs> all right. So, and there it is. We replumbed the, su the septic ourselves. So, you know, if you think being a pastor's, so you got to get down in the mud and Plumb a septic tank sometimes. It is done. There's our final grade. Okay, after everything's done, final grade. Pressure wash the excavator. It's going back that day. And then, of course, here we're making batter boards with the boys. Everybody works at the house. And if you don't have a covered trailer, I highly encourage you to get a school bus to have all your lumber. So you save big time on delivery costs if you can just grab a school bus and drive it yourself. It's always cheaper to do it yourself. And that's a 26 footer, so yes, it will fit all the lumber we needed in it. And of course here, that's another, there's John. He's out of the excavator now. The next day, he's actually helping dig the footers. So he, he does quite a bit. He, all the boys are out there. Here it is, we have the platform done, ready to roll. It's all of us after a few days work a little further along now and then of course uh, during the time I was able after between building houses and, and taking time off I actually did uh, Martha and I went to a meeting here in Sandpoint where we met uh, Sarah Weaver so we met Sarah Weaver in person she I have a signed autograph copy of her book and she also donated a copy to the church so that was something else a very interesting that happened so we got that. Uh, Miss Martha went on a trip to meet some uh, friends in, um, was it Wyoming? All the way to? Oh, Rapid City, South Coast. So she, she went on a long little road trip. She drove her own vehicle. And before she did that, I took her vehicle here to the shop under the church. And I changed all of her tires, balanced them mounted them, checked her brakes, lines, belts, hoses, fuses, bulbs, and fluids. So she got a full bumper-to-bumper -bumper PMCS and brand new tires uh, because she has her own mechanic <laughs> downstairs, <laughs> Pastor Reed. So anyway, um, we did that for Miss Martha. Also, uh, my dad changed the carburetor on the Cub Cadet. We've been having a problem with the uh, mower just cutting off. Now, the problem with Cub Cadet, the new ones, is it has this IntelliPower ECU here that causes more problems than it's worth. But anyway, what we think is it was actually the solenoid causing the um, faulty solenoid that will cut off the fuel to the lawn tractor and then it just cuts off randomly. And um, I did not get the genuine OEM Cub Cadet part because it was more expeditious and cheaper to get the one from China, <laughs> right? So I just grabbed that one from um, uh, Amazon, the problem is, is that was the difference between $50 and almost $200. So when dad took the other one off, I looked at it to see if I could find the problem and see if the gaskets were wore out or anything else. The Cub Cadet warranty place had put the same Chinese one on, <laughs> much to my chagrin. <laughs> 
So watch out for that. Just because you go to an authorized dealer doesn't mean they're putting on OEM, genuine OEM parts. But anyway, the mower works, and we're back on schedule. So I also, since Miss Martha had her uh, truck tires getting switched over, I already had my tire machine and things out. So I was showing you that while I was doing that, among other things, uh, carburetors, mowing, and Miss Martha's car, I also decided to put um, some 18-inch uh, tires on the back of the Ford Ranger to give it a little bit of a ranch pickup. And right there, I'm at 34 and one half on, those aren't even stock, those are Jeep rims. And now I think I'm pushing 37 inches on the back end. So, and yes, that is a, uh, that is official Bigfoot search vehicle. I bought the truck that way. Um, I didn't complain about the OD green. So uh, it's a good conversation starter. And the guy that owned the truck had a wood car, he hand carved the Bigfoot diorama there in my dash. So Pastor Reed has a Bigfoot, and you've visited me, everybody's seen the, the Bigfoot truck, the Sasquatch. But I do represent America's Promise right there, boom. So we do offer those in the uh, bookstore, actually. It's, Happiness is America Obeying God's Law, and it's got the America's Promise symbol there. So uh, I do see people uh, looking at that. I've had thumbs up. Um, I've had some people shake their heads. I've had some people take pictures of that <coughs> or my plate. I was kind of parked <laughs> weird, so I don't know which one they were taking a picture of. But, and I often think, you know, they'll see the Marine Corps sticker, the AP, the AP, and then Sasquatch over there. So either way, I've got a conversation starter. <laughs> I haven't really figured out how to tie the America's Promise with the Bigfoot message yet, but I do get some practice. A guy at the gas station the other day uh, was filling up next to me, and he said, have you seen him? And I didn't know. I said, no, but we keep looking. And he, he was serious. <laughs> he said that he lived on his property. Okay, well, my wife and I know for sure that Bigfoot, or at least a family of Sasquatches, lives on our property. We have plenty of tree stu structures to show for it, and occasional tree knocks. So, yes, we watched the whole documentary on how to identify whether or not Bigfoot lives on your land. Now, we haven't gotten plaster castings of the footprints yet, but we're on the lookout. And, of course, we have the official truck to go with it. But just one big joke to most everyone I meet. Most everyone I meet. And then, of course, an after picture of the new... Yeah, now those are Mazda rims. So just so you know, uh, the 94 Ranger has a... 5x4.5 bolt pattern, which would be 5x114.3 millimeters for you metric guys out there. And yes, the old Mazda rims will indeed fit on an old um, Ranger. And I just found out this morning was on YouTube, anything from 95 or older is considered a classic. Now I feel old. <laughs> that makes me a classic. <laughs> that makes this truck a classic. All right, so I can't wait to have everybody start berating me because Pastor Reed drives a classic pickup truck. Yes, yes I do. With uh, a ranch lift on Mazda rims and Jeep Cherokee rims. Yeah, okay, so anyway, so is it all fun and games then, being a pastor with these rims and stuff? It's a Facebook marketplace, a uh, lady in Sagal. Uh, I went to Sagal while uh, all, all this was going on, you know, and... Uh, I went up to the place and, and I thought, well, she had these for sale on Facebook, but of course nobody ever tells you the tire size, the width, or the bolt pattern. So the only thing I could do when I went up to the Facebook marketplace, um, with it, she was in Sagal, I went up there and I, I pulled up and I saw a for sale sign at the house and um, she waved me in and I parked outside of the driveway. She said, no, the tires are in here. I was like, okay, so I pulled into this little... Um, little pole barn she had, and uh, went in. I said, ma'am, this is going to sound kind of odd, but I did bring my three-ton floor jack and a four-way tire iron. I would like to see if these fit my truck because you didn't put the bolt pattern size on there, and if they do fit, I'll take them off your hands. And she's like, fine, no big deal. And she had them stacked in the barn two by two. And uh, she saw the America's Promise sticker on the back of the truck and was asking me, you know, about those things. I said, oh, I'm in Sandpoint, you know, and this is what we teach, and She's like, wow, that really, sounds, that really sounds amazing. And she was Christian as well. And uh, I asked her, I said, well, uh, so I, I took the tire iron out of the truck, and I'm pulling the lug nuts off of my truck, and I already had it jacked up. 
I'm loosening the lug nuts and I'm asking her, you know, hey, I, I see your, it's for sale sign outside your house. Are you guys moving in or moving out? You know, and she's like, oh, we're moving out. We're uh, moving out of state. And then I said, oh, well, that's strange. Um, I said, well, a lot of people are usually moving into Sandpoint. It's a wonderful place to be. And I couldn't imagine why you'd want to move out of Sandpoint, you know. And uh, I was talking to her as I was pulling these lug nuts off. And I know she'd gotten quiet, so, you know, and I asked her, well, you're moving out. That's weird. You know, it's a great place to live. And, she, and I turned around, and she had, she had started to weep. And I said, well, I was like, what's wrong? And she said, my husband is dying, and we're moving. And she just sat right there on those tires and cried and cried and cried. And I'm here in uh, work clothes and shop rag hanging on my back pocket. And I'm not in a suit but I'm still a king of minister. And I carry a Bible with me in my truck. This one I took paintballing with me, so I always have a Bible on me. And um, I didn't really know what to do. I did, but I didn't. You know, I, I usually counsel people in the, the church or in the office. It doesn't, but it can pop up anywhere. And I said, um, so I took the Bible out. And I said, I have, I have something um, I'd like to read with you. So I took this little teeny pocket Bible out, and I read her this. I said, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither pain shall be there any more, for the former things are passed away. And that's what I read the lady uh, sitting there on those tires. And I wanted to know that, I wanted you to know that if you get into a situation all of a sudden and you think about these things and you have to comfort people, our own people in Zion, what is it that you tell them? You need to tell them truths. I could say anything I wanted to under the sun there and say, well, I, I can't understand how you're feeling or anything like that. The lady was in distress. And the only comfort I thought I could bring her was the true words of God. That's the only thing. And you could see her countenance did change after I read these things. And I explained her to her that Kingdom Idea Ministers and our church here, we believe in that great city and the everlasting joy that ensues in the kingdom age, and that we will see our friends and loved ones once again. And her countenance was changed, and this woman, this inhabitant of Zion, was indeed comforted. Indeed comforted. So just so you know, most of the time I tell people, I'll, I'll find that the, the cleaner clothes that I wear are usually the ones that I do the hardest work in. <laughs> but in this particular case, just Facebook Marketplace, buying some rims for an old Ford. I turned around and I said, oh boy, time to be the pastor. Right. And so I went in and prayed with her and her husband, and I left. And I didn't stop thinking about that for a long time. So that's what's been going on in the life of Pastor Reed and his church, and I am a servant, as we all are. So always carry a Bible with you, even to paintball, even to a Facebook marketplace to buy some old Mazda rims. You never know when you need it. Better to have and not need. But I can't think of a reason when we'd ever not need this. So better to have at all times. So we've been talking about Zion, the kingdom age, the fall of Babylon, and the return of Christ, right? Over the last few weeks. I know it's been a while. And all those things are tied in together, as we're starting to see, right? As the Bible tells us. So we're going to read a few verses about Christ's return, and then we'll get into what we're teaching this morning. So first we're going to go to Acts 3, verse 19 and 20. Very familiar verses to us. These are Peter's words. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Christ which before was preached unto you. All right. So this like similar verses are famous verses and this of course is foretelling the uh, second return of Christ. Acts 3.21, whom Christ, of course, 
whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, there seems to be something here in Acts 3.21 called the restitution of all things, and it seems that this time, the return of Christ is predicated upon this, times of restitution of all things. Now, the word restitution is not often heard in modern church from the mouths of modern ministers or within the modern church circles anymore. And that's uh, one major factor or reason behind that, I believe, is the fact that the false doctrine known as the rapture has te- been taught more and more. So you won't hear about the times of refreshing or the restor- restitution or restoration of all things because it's, of course, the rapture doctrine that usually cancels this out as a whole and uh, it says that, well, Jesus will return and when the world is in the uh, midst of chaos and uproar and rapture or secretly whisk his believers off to the heaven of the churches. But this verse here says that the return of Christ, of course, has something to do with the restitution of all things. All right. Verse 22, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise unto you of your, up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. So we know that that is Jesus Christ being talked about by Moses because Jesus Christ is a prophet like unto Moses. And actually Peter is quoting Moses' words from Deuteronomy chapter 18, by the way. So there you go. Acts 3. Verse 23 and 24, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear the prophet shall be destroyed from among the people, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. What days? Well, the times of restitution of all things. That's what the prophets teach. Amazing that we don't hear it anymore. Because apparently what Peter says, Samuel all the way down, that's all they talked about. The times of refreshing, the return of Christ, and the restitution of all things. Now, Peter, next, in this next verse, he's going to tell us exactly to whom this message is addressed. Acts 3, 25 and 26. Ye, the people Peter's addressing, of course, are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God has made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall the kindreds of the earth be blessed unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So Peter's addressing a specific people here whom he identifies as who? The children of the prophets and the children of the covenant. Right? Both are indicative of the children of Israel. Very definitely. So Jesus' return and the restitution of all things have something to do with these people here in Acts 3. And of course, you notice it has to be the Israel people because Peter says, our fathers, and he begins with Abraham. Okay, just so we're clear, that is Peter addressing the children of Israel in the New Testament. Not this spiritual Israel new church. Where do we get that idea? Peter here identifies them very specifically. It's very important that we understand these things. Now that's the new scripture, so let's go back to Isaiah since we've been looking at it for the last few sermons and find out if it has anything to do with this, anything to do with us, this age, in this time, or in this nation and land. We should also investigate, by the way, as we're going along, whether or not Isaiah and Peter's message are addressed to the same people. Okay? And of course, we'll go to Isaiah Chapter 51, verse 1, we'll start there. Verse 1 I read, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Okay, now, to whom is this addressed? Well, ye that seek after righteousness, right? And ye that seek the Lord. So, in a nutshell, this is addressed, at least this verse, to lawful Christians, right? Or at least Christians who believe in Jesus. And Christians who believe in Jesus and have a desire for righteousness, right? Okay, so that limits this verse here. 
is limited to addressing Christians at least. Agreed? Okay. This verse is also instructing us to go back and look at our history. Find out where you came from. Our origins, right? These people who follow the Lord in righteousness. Verse 2. Look unto Abraham your father and Sarah that bare you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. That's the Abrahamic covenant. We're all familiar with that. So, just like we saw with Peter in Acts, though, the origin of these people is again Abraham. Both Peter and Isaiah are speaking to whom? Christians whose father and mother are Abraham and Sarah once again. So there's no doubt Peter and Isaiah are talking to the same people. Verse 3, For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. This verse brings a few weeks' worth of my sermons around just in one, doesn't it? And you see here, right here in a few verses, we've got that waste places, they'll be covered, uh, comforted, made new, refreshed, restored, like a garden. We've talked about that with our waste cities. Of course, we've got Zion here. That would be end time Zion, which we'll get to later. Of course, we're talking about kingdom age prophecy here at the end. So you see, it's a composite of all the few sermons we've had preached over the last uh, few weeks. So they're right here from verse 1 to 3, at least in Isaiah 51, we've read that there is a call to a certain people who are the physical offspring of Abraham. That call is to go back and learn and find out about your history and your beginning because according to verse 3, the Lord shall comfort Zion. You go back and find out about Abraham and Sarah because God is going to do something to Zion. Why? Because of the kingdom. Because of the kingdom. The times of refreshing, the times of the restitution of all things. So, what's Peter's point? What was Isaiah's point here? Why is Pastor Reed stressing this Abraham and Sarah? Why? Because we cannot understand what God is going to do to Zion and in the kingdom until we understand Abraham Isaac, Jacob, and the Israel people. You see? We cannot understand Zion until we understand Abraham, our father, and Sarah that bear you. Our history. The foundation of our kingdom understanding is that. That's the genesis. That's the beginning. We as the Israel people are called to look back at our foundation in order to be equipped so that we can see and understand and discern God's future plans for us and Zion, his kingdom nation. That's why we're exhorted to do these things. The message of the modern ministers is confused. It's a confused and muddled mess. Why? Well, they're attempting to put the roof on something without ever having laid a foundation. And you saw earlier the construction pictures I shared with you, our final grade with the blocks and the footers. Did you see any of the trusses up before that? Did you see any attics? Sheet metal on the roof? Would you have thought I was, knew what I was doing if I'd showed you that we were building the attic before we started the groundwork? No, but you see, of course not. Why? Because you don't build houses that way. You don't build concepts that way. And you see the modern ministers have done that. That's why the churches are so confused. And the next three verses we'll read quickly because it tells of God's future plans with Zion. So for, and we see that that is, or because of what has occurred in verse 1 and 2, the Lord will do something, so find out who you are and where you came from. Verse 4, hearken unto me. Notice there's a call for these people to listen. You'll see that three times as we go along. Hearken unto me, O my people, uh, um, I'm sorry, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. Okay? Verse 5, My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and mine arm shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm they trust. Same people being addressed. Children of Zion. 
Verse 6, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. These are all truths God's communicating to his people through the prophet Isaiah. So this is what God intends and plans to do in Zion. And of course, this Zion we're talking about, if you've been following our, verse, our sermons for the last few weeks, that is the end time regathered Israel people. Okay, let's look at verse 7 and 8 in Isaiah 51. Hearken, there's that repetition again, listen up, you Israelites, lawful Christians whose father is Abraham, hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings, for the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. And notice there's salvation in the Old Testament once again. So verse 4, we had read that he said that law shall proceed out, but by the time we get to verse 7, here the people being addressed are now people whose Law, who's ha- in their heart, is God's law. Is God's law. So what does the new covenant say? But this shall be the covenant that I will make with who? The house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So by the time you get here in Isaiah 51, verse 7 and 8, you see that we, he's telling those people it must be Israelites under the new covenant, which of course automatically makes this new age or in time prophecy, that there's, in the hearts and minds of these people, God has written his law. Again, indicative of Israel, Israel only. So the Israel people are the people being described here who, according to the new covenant, have the law written in their hearts and minds. And I know that we're not yet in the perfected kingdom or the perfected kingdom age yet, but I know and you know that God has put an earnest of this into our people now in this age because we can observe this ourselves in our own nation that people do seek to do the law of God. They do know righteousness, lawful Christians. We do see that. People know they shouldn't be under these forms of bondage from the government. We know right from wrong. God has put that in earnest into his people. These Israel people are a breed apart, you see, because God's law is in their hearts and minds. So, if you read Isaiah 51, actually, in its entirety, you will see that uh, it's an overview of the entire history of the Israel people from their beginning right down to the resurrection and the times of restitution of all things. And we're not going to go through the entire chapter this morning, but you'll find that that is a rich history of Israel from their beginning all the way to the end of the age the perfected kingdom age on into that. We'll go to Isaiah 51, 9. But awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in the ancient days and the generations of old, art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Okay, so you see this is a call to who? Well, the arm of the Lord. Who's that? Israel. With them I will... Shatter nations, you are my battle axe. You know that? Same book, Isaiah. Okay. Awake, awake. Put on strength, Israel. As in the ancient days, in the generations of old. And of course, you all know, he's cut Rahath into pieces and wounded the dragon. That all makes perfect sense to you. That's not out of place at all. Not that Rahab from the battle of Jericho, Joshua chapter 6. Not that one. Neither is it the Rahab over there in Matthew the genealogy. That actually has a C there. Okay, so it's not that Rahab. So what's going on? Well, it has a different Hebrew spelling for one. The Rahab, the heroine from Joshua. Remember the innkeeper? Okay, that's her name there in the Hebrew. And then the Rahab here in Isaiah 51, 9, the only difference is that middle letter. You see that? Other than these little symbols here to tell you how to pronounce that. But there, So we see it is a different spelling. I looked it up, okay? So the etymology of this word for those uh, guys out there that want to know. This Rahab that's mentioned in Isaiah is from Strong's number 07294. It's a masculine noun, so it cannot be the innkeeper from Joshua. It means arrogance, 
a mythical sea monster, emblematic name of Egypt. Okay, and we're going to turn this all around now. So here's an example of that word being used instead of Egypt. Psalm 87.4, I proclaim Egypt, and here it's used Rahab, you see. Okay, so the, the word from Isaiah means Egypt or a sea monster. I proclaim Egypt and Babylon among those who know me. Behold, the land of the Philistines, Tyre with the Ethiopia, in Zion they were born. Now we're not getting into this verse because I can open a whole can of worms about how these countries originated from Zion. It's going to blow your minds. We'll get there one of these days. Okay, but anyway, all this verse right now for this morning, your takeaway is not that these nations came from Zion. Okay, that Egypt and Rahab are interchangeable as used as an emblematic name of Egypt. Okay, here's another example. Two witnesses, of course. You crushed Egypt, Rahab, like a corpse and scattered your enemies by the power of your arm. Okay, and here's another example where Rahab isn't used in place of Egypt, but you'll see something else. In Ezekiel 29, verse 3, Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Okay, now remember, now this should be similar language when you think about that Assyrian king that got a little too big for his britches as well. Right? And God knocked him down a few pegs. That's Lucifer. He thought himself as a great king, right? The great king, a great light. So here it's almost the same thing. In this case, instead of the Assyrian king named, it's the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Okay, so look here. Egypt is not named Rahab in this passage, like the other ones I'd shown you, I know. But here Egypt is described as a monster or sea beast, right? Lurking in the waters of the Nile. So you see how that Rahab study we did a few moments earlier fits that it could be an emblematic name of Egypt or a sea monster. You see, and these things are likened to one another throughout prophecy. All right, so back to Isaiah 51.9. So what's being said here? Awake, awake, Israel. Put on strength, Israel, the arm of the Lord. Awake, as in the ancient days and the generations of old, art thou now who have cut Rahab, Egypt, and wounded the dragon? So here's again a recital of Israel history, is it not? So God assisted his people back in Egypt in the days of old by doing what? Parting the waters of the Red Sea and allowing them to escape the beast government of Pharaoh's Egypt, which in effect wounded or weakened it, right? And of course, I can back all this up in verse 10. Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depth of the sea a way for the ransomed to pass over? And there it is. So yes, verse 9 is talking about the fact that God helped us, his children out in the days of old by parting that great sea, by cutting that great sea into pieces, assisting his people in crossing over, and in effect wounding the beast government of Egypt. Okay, very, very good. And there it is, verse 10, is a second witness to what I just said. And of course, I want to say this again. God, throughout the Bible, constantly reminds us of our history. Of our history. What happened after we left Egypt? Isaiah tells us in the next verse. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and with singing... Come un with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Now, didn't I just read that verse to the lady there in the Facebook? I did, didn't I? It's the same future. It's the same promise. It's the same kingdom. Right? Now, all of a sudden, we're reading about Egypt and our history and what God's done for his people in their times of trouble and distress should and when they look to him, right? And then all of a sudden now, we're in end-time prophecy. One verse to the other, immediately. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? One verse over. And I'll show you. So, Isaiah is currently speaking. In this context of this book, Isaiah is currently speaking to the exiles of Babylon. And what is he saying? Isaiah is saying, as we go along, 
He says, You lawful Christians who remain, your father and mother are Abraham and Sarah. The, land, the Lord has plans for you beyond your current circumstances. So listen up, because it will be a great comfort to you. Look to God and his salvation. Follow him and trust in him. Did he not deliver the generations of old from the great enemy Egypt by parting the sea? Afterwards, they were given a garden in the land of paradise where there was joy and thanksgiving and singing. Though physical things perish and, men's wor and men die, God's word stands forever. As God has done this before, remain true to him and he will do this for you. That's what Isaiah is saying to these exiles in Babylon, is he not? Now, now let Pastor Reed address not the exiles in Babylon from Isaiah's day, but the exiles in Babylon captivity today. That's how prophecy works. Isaiah is speaking to both the people of his time and us upon whom the latter days have come. Right? So let's address these new Israelites in the new land of Zion. So what's he saying here? Listen up, all you lawful Christians who follow the king. Go back and read the old scriptures. Read about Abraham your father and Sarah your mother and read about what God has done for his children Israel. While captive in Egypt, God delivered us miraculously from the government of Pharaoh. He comforted us by making us his holy nation and took us as his wife, giving us his law, a land of our own, where we were full of joy and praise. You people of the new covenant, do not fear man or man's government. They, along with the physical and worldly things, will fade away. But God's word and law and his promises remain forever. Just as he did in the past, God will deliver those faithful children of his into a new place of their own called Zion. And in this new age, called the kingdom age, we will be married once again, and we shall have joy once again. Isn't that what Isaiah is saying to us? Isn't that what Pastor Reed just pulled from the end time prophecies of Isaiah chapter 51? Now, how do I know these things? Well, what I read earlier. My second witness, of course, is always, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Hearken unto me, Israelites of the new covenant, these are God's plans for us. We read them again in Revelation, verse 21, 2 through 4. And I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's how God comforts Zion, is it not? Now how do I know they are true? How do I know these things to be true? Because I said, when you counsel others, when you comfort inhabitants of Zion, you want to be sure that your words are true course no truer words are found other than in this book look at verse 5 and he that sat upon the throne said behold i make all things new and he said unto me write for these words are true and faithful that's how i know those things are true so you bet all the things we read in this bible about the end of the age prophecies given unto us are true we will be married again to the king and we'll have joy right what kind of joy well Everlasting joy. Everlasting joy, according to Isaiah. So where does all this come from? Isaiah 51, 12. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou, that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the Son of Man, which shall be made as grass? So you see, even in our current Babylonian captivity, you do not fear men, but you fear God and you trust him. Isaiah is speaking to both the captive exiles of his day and, of course, us in this age under the captivity of a new Babylon, Mystery Babylon, right? Okay, and if you fear God over men, then what is it you're doing? According to verse 13, And forgettest the Lord thy Maker, that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, 
as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Now you see what God's saying is, while in captivity, do not forget God or his promises by preoccupying yourself with the fear of oppressive rulers. God will take care of them. But you'll have to trust God. All right, let's look at verse 14. The captive exile hasteneth that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit, nor that his bread should fail. Now, this verse should be evident in our people today. You hear this all the time, that the captive exile is hastening that he may be loosed. Right? We hear this all the time from our people about the oppression of the systems that are over us, that take away our liberties and take away our resources and the things we work for with our hands. These people that complain against Pharaoh's government are hastening that they may be loosed. And that's a good thing. However, sometimes we need to take a step back and allow God to do things in his own time instead of having to take it into our own hands. That's where Israel gets in trouble a lot of the time. Now, God is in control. And of course, our final freedom from our oppressive rulers is not on our own timetable, nor is it on our own terms. We do not set the time for this loosening from this captivity we're currently in. That's on God's terms, of course. Verse 15, But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. So even in this time of captivity and oppression, God is in control of all things. And if we look back to our own history, of course, we can read all about a great redemption and a national deliverance that God brought about for his people Israel. Not because of anything his children did, but because, because he swore an oath to Abraham. Keep that in mind. So what is the comfort we receive when we understand Christ, Zion, and the kingdom? Well, verse 16 of Isaiah chapter 51 tells us, And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens, and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Our comfort in this age of beast systems, oppressions, captivity under Babylon, is that God has protected us and saved us for a great and special purpose. We, whose father are Abraham and whose mother is Sarah, are to use God's words which are put into our mouths to lay the foundations in Zion to prepare the way for the king's return. That's our purpose, and that's our great hope.